The energy of one proton from E equals mc squared is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10th joules, and its mass is 1.67 times 10 to the negative 27th kilograms. So our 10,000 tons disintegrates into 9 times 10 to the 23rd joules, which is 20 times greater than the final energy of the craft. On a per second basis, we are annihilating about 3.3 kilograms of matter antimatter per second, which is about 3 times 10 to the 17th joules per second, or 300,000 terajoules per second, which is equivalent to 1.25 times the Tsar bomb, which was 58 megatons and the biggest hydrogen bomb ever exploded by the Soviet Union in October 1961. You can see the problem with antimatter is just too powerful to use at even modest accelerations. Obviously this amount of energy focused out the ass end of our craft by a nozzle shaped combustion chamber would just atomize it instantly in the very first second. We have to accelerate much more slowly. Instead of 85 days acceleration, let's try 100 times more at 8,500 days, or 23 years, at 1 100th g. In this case, we're blowing up our fuel at only 3,000 terajoules per second. That's better. At this rate, we're only detonating 47 Hiroshima-type bombs, which were 63 terajoules, per second in our combustion chamber. Obviously, we can't use antimatter to obtain velocities which are significant fractions of light velocity. Another proposed reaction propulsion system is the laser beam pushed from home, wherein we fire an Earth-based laser at the rear end of our spacecraft and accelerate it to infinity and beyond. Unfortunately, this method fails because a constant energy laser which is what we use, also can't provide for the 2n-1 energy increases required by a constant acceleration. Consider an impossible hypothetical perfect system wherein all the energy of the laser is received by the spacecraft at any distance and completely converted into kinetic energy. Our kinetic energy gain is directly proportional to n but our velocity is proportional to the square root of n. So it weakens drastically with time. After 10,000 seconds, we're down to 1 200th of the acceleration of the first second. Actually, in all the above examples, I've left out an important fact, which is that you need over twice the amount of fuel because you need to stop at the destination by reversing the direction of your thrust after half of the journey. Most interplanetary calculations are extremely theoretical and omit power ratings. They generally address only the total energy requirement and not the hardware that must take quite an obvious beating by way of the second law of thermodynamics. If momentum conservation and the first and second laws of thermodynamics hold, speed kills, so it looks like we might go to the stars if we go very slowly. None of what I've calculated so far is disputable, it's just a straightforward extension of the known laws of physics. So how do they do it? Right off we can say something about the machinery of their craft from our knowledge of the geometry of our universe. All regular periodic machine functions are elliptical functions, that is, everything that occurs in the machine that continues to run without a geometrical need to stop can only have parts that go back and forth, an ellipse of infinite eccentricity, go round and round in circles, an ellipse of zero eccentricity, or go round in ellipses of finite eccentricity. That's it. There is nothing else to do in our universe. Now any machine that goes back and forth tends to rattle and shake itself apart. 
at high speeds and high energy, it's unlikely that a UFO would have anything going back and forth. That leaves us with rotation. Something rotates, and depending on what you do with that, it moves all by itself like a UFO does. What can you do with whatever is rotating? You can cool it and make it superconducting, and you can subject it to all manner of electric and magnetic fields. That's all you can do. There really isn't anything else in this universe, except maybe water wheels. Every technically advanced machine ever made or ever to be made must start with the above stuff because there's nothing else available to physical beings. The bare fact is that we have only straight up mechanical actions like gears and wheels and pistons and we have the electromagnetic interaction. Without electric and magnetic fields, we're simply back to the horse plow era. Suppose you can make an artificial gravitational field really strong and monkey that into a saucer. How will you produce that field? You can only get it from manipulating the electromagnetic field, because there isn't anything else. You can also argue that there is a nuclear force, but you can't put your mitts on it without the electromagnetic field. It's off limits without something to grab it with, just like gravity. What I'm getting at here is the abysmal paucity of working materials in the universe. There just isn't anything to work with. To build a machine, you can only make changes in the arrangements of your electromagnetic and metallic junk. That's it. There ain't no more. You can make up an endless menagerie of words naming and describing the amazing things you found in the universe. All the discoveries in every field. Line up all subatomic particles. Every point of order in quantum mechanics and general relativity. Every black hole had a cure for every known disease. All the knowledge of man from here to eternity. And after all that, all you will have left to make a propulsion system with are gears and levers and wheels and pistons and the electromagnetic interaction. There is no more. So what do you want to do? You know something is rotating. You know there are magnetic fields. You know from the above calculations that you're going nowhere if all the conservation laws are unbreachable. Now you can see my point of view. A reactionless drive is the only thing that will account for the observed performance of UFOs without burning them up and get them here from other solar systems. Don't be misled by force fields reported by witnesses. Those force fields are undoubtedly there, but they are not the primary drive. Anti-gravity force fields can't produce interstellar scale velocities. They're redirecting the centrifugal vectors of whatever is rotating in the saucer using magnetic and or electric fields of unknown strength and configuration. From a constant force, our visitors are bypassing linear momentum conservation and producing energy from nothing. Their power plant doesn't need to increase its output as they accelerate. The 2n-1 multiplier does not apply in a restrictive manner if energy conservation is invalid. They hover whether there is gravity or not. They go in space as well as in the air and underwater too. Energy is just dirt to them. They flip a switch and they're hooked up to the wheel work of the universe, just as Tesla envisioned.